Hi, everybody. This is Kim and Mark. We're back after the holidays. And we just went through a really great Bible study, and we wanted to share it with you. As usual, it's the uh, study of Ecclesiastes, and it's Wisdom for Living Well, an in-depth Bible study. And this lesson is called Dreaming to the Glory of God. So uh, we'd like to pray first, the, just so you can be prepared. Um, we're going to be going over Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. And then there's also going to be, well, there's going to be Matthew 6, 7. And there's also going to be, before that, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And I think that's all the chapters that, all the verses and chapters that we're going to be um, reading today. So let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all of your blessings. We ask that you please bless this Bible study um, so that we may be edified by it. We may learn and open our minds to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So. It says, slowly read Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. Can you read that? Okay, I'm going to be reading from the Living Bible. As you enter the temple, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Don't be a fool who doesn't even realize it is sinful to make rash promises to God. For he is in heaven and you are only here on earth. So let your words be few. Just as being too busy gives you nightmares, so being a fool makes you a blabbermouth. So when you talk to God and vow to him that you will do something, don't delay in doing it, for God has no pleasure in fools. Keep your promise to him. It is far better not to say you'll do something than to say you will and then not do it. In that case, your mouth is making you sin. Don't try to defend yourself by telling the messenger from God that it was all a mistake to make the vow. That would make God very angry, and he might destroy your prosperity. Dreaming instead of doing is foolishness. There is ruin in a flood of empty words. Fear God instead. Thanks, honey. By nature, man is instinctively religious. We long to worship something. But some have turned religion into a charade where they attend church on Sundays, say prayers, and make vows but live contrary to God's word the other six days of the week. Before entering the house of God, how do you prepare yourself for corporate worship? Well, I, I, I pray that, uh, that he forgives me of all my sins and thought, word, and, and indeed, so I want to be found acceptable in his sight for anything. And I want to be uh, made clean. That's really good. Um, what I do before I um, go into you know church or go online for church is I make sure that I'm ready to take notes. Um, I always take notes um, during sermons. It's important for me. It's part of my learning process. So, so that's something that I do. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're commanded as believers to come together. It is not optional, but the manner in which we come matters as well. We are commanded as believers to come together. So what strong warning does Solomon give in verse 1? Verse 1 says, as you enter the temple, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Um, in the NIV version, it says, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Solomon cautions the way we approach God and the way we speak to God. What did you learn about the use of your words when speaking to God in prayer 
in verses two and three. So in the NIV version, uh, it says, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart or anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let that word be true. Don't make promises. Uh, don't just be, you know, spewing words. And, uh, I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, it's far better not to say, to say you will and then not. Right. Definitely. What does Proverbs 29 20 say about a man who is reckless with his words? So let's look that up. Proverbs 29 20. Here. It says, Do you see a man taste words? There is more hope for him. Much says it all. Speaking slowly, carefully, thoughtfully, and sincerely to God is an indication of wisdom. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 7, Jesus taught, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. God is not impressed by our many words. And in verses four through seven, we're cautioned when making vows to God. How do women say we should make them? Talk to God, vow to them that you will do something. Don't delay in doing it, for God has no pleasure in fools. It is far worse, it is far better not to say you'll do something than to say you will and then not do it. So how does he say we should make them? You shouldn't delay in doing it, um, but you have to keep your promises to God. You can't just say, well, I'm going to quit smoking, and I promise you, God, that I'm never going to smoke another cigarette. You can't make that promise if you can't keep it. So that's kind of an example. In Hebrew, the word vow is nidar, which means to promise, to do or give something to God. What are some examples or vows or promises you have voluntarily made to God? Well, when uh, kids were little, I vowed to be their protector and do all I could do to make sure they were safe, well taken care of, uh, you know, guardian, mm -hmm. guard over them. Uh, that was a vow I made. I think there's certain situations, too. I can totally relate to that. Also, the marriage vow. Mm -hmm. um, also... You know what else I thought of? Of when someone's in court and they swear to tell the truth before God. When they swear to tell the truth before God, that means they have to tell the truth. They can't lie. So they're vowing in right. court as well. So the there's different separate. situations like that as well. When you're bringing up God and you're saying that you're promising to God yeah. that you're going to do something, then that means you have to do it. And I think it should be it. in our everyday life dealing with friends and family and people. Mm -hmm. you no, know, don't say you're going to, hey, I'll be there, I'll help you out. And then really, they're just words out of your mouth. They're not, they're not really right. a vow or a promise to do it. You're just blabbing it out, like it says in here. Yeah. In the, in the living Bible. I agree. Imagine yeah. how you feel if someone makes a promise to you and you don't keep it. Imagine, and, and they don't keep it. They don't keep a promise to you. Imagine how bad that makes you feel then imagine how it feels when you make a promise to God and you don't keep it. That's that's even more, much more than you can imagine. And um, you want to keep your promises to God so that you don't anger him. In verse 6, we see an excuse made for breaking the vow. 
And what is a common excuse and how does God respond to our broken vows? It says, um, in that case, your mouth is making you sin. Don't try to defend yourself by telling the messenger from God that it was all a mistake to make the vow. That would make God very angry and he might destroy your prosperity. So there it is right there. I know um, people might say, oh, I forgot or I was weak or, you know, yeah, an plenty, excuse of, plenty some, of excuses. Story, right? yeah. yeah. But it says right here that when you make a promise to God, you know, um, your mouth is making you sin if you break that promise. Um, whenever a messenger of God or a priest from the temple came to collect on a vow that had been made possibly a financial promise or gift, the individual wanted to be free of their promise to God. When vows are made to the best of our ability, they should be kept. This includes marriage vows. In this passage, the words dream and dreams are mentioned. So it says verse three and seven, um, just as being too busy gives you nightmares, so being a fool makes you a blabbermouth. And seven, don't try to defend yourself by telling the messenger from God that it was a mistake to make the vow that would make God very angry. He might destroy your prosperity. Dreaming instead is foolishness and there is ruin in a flood of empty words. Fear God instead. God is the one we must fear. We live in a world where the mantra to our children is dream big. If they can imagine it, they can do it. Ecclesiastes tells us dreams come with much busyness and vanity. To put it another way, dreams come with a lot of hard work, and sometimes that hard work becomes vanity when it is outside the will of God. We must lay every dream before God, before his throne in prayer, and wait and listen and seek God's will for our lives. And so there is a discussion question. Do you have a dream? What is it? Have you asked God what his will is for that dream? So we were talking about what our dreams are. And they pretty much involve our children. Our children and our grandchildren hold our dreams. We love them. And um, we, of course, are is to you know a lifelong happy marriage and our children and our grandchildren are a part of that so they are our dreams and um, we love them and we just pray for them and just pray that they'll have the the most uh, happiness and prosperity and the best relationship with God did yeah, you have he, anything I share the same dream and for the, for the, our, our friends and relatives there that don't know Christ mm -hmm. our dream for them to come to Christ yes yeah. absolutely yeah. of course the children when they're able to make that decision the mm -hmm. grandchildren mm -hmm. and children yes I agree with you that's our dream and that is in line with God's word um, as verse 2 says God is in heaven and you are on earth his ways are higher than ours. We must not be hasty following every whim we can imagine and making vows to God. Shouldn't just say, promise something and swear to God that you're going to do it or promise God that you're going to do it if you can't keep that promise. That's a very serious promise. Sometimes of our dreams, we're tempted to vow to God that a certain percentage of what we make will go to feed the hungry or build an orphanage. Then all too often the money comes in and the vow to give back to God is broken. Let's not be hasty. Let's keep our promises to God. Pray now and give your dreams to the Lord for his glory. Well, Mark and I, as usual, really loved this lesson and we wanted to share it with you as we always do. We pray that you have... Uh, loving, prosperous new year that your relationship with 
at the house and that you have a good relationship with him and come back and join us again for our Bible study.